Daniel is an amazing leader, and we are honored uh, to have him in our midst. So, Daniel, thank you for saying uh, yes to God's call to light and life. We've been watching your ministry with crew, and now, really, I feel honored to have you. And church, it's awesome to be with you. Deb and I, in the last... Uh, Four weeks have been ministered in five different states, and wherever we go, and we're getting ready to go to Berlin and Africa for the ne uh, during the next four weeks, but wherever we go, you are. I really mean that. We depend upon your love and your prayers as we go wherever we are ministering in the name of Jesus first, but also in the name of light and life. And so, Deb and I just want you to know that we love you, we appreciate you, we need you, we pray for you. When we aren't here, you're in our hearts, and we try and watch the services, and uh, boy, God is doing good things at Light and Life. If you believe that, would you say Amen. Would you take your Bibles and turn to 1 John chapter 3? We're going to be in verses 1 to 3. And we're in this series called Fear of God. I googled weird foods that taste good together, and this is what I got. Peanut butter and pickles. Uh, French fries and ice cream. Milk on popcorn. Mustard and Oreos. Bacon and peanut butter? Yeah. Oh, that one I understand, because bacon plus anything is, uh, is just amazing. I'm going to tell you, I love bacon. But how about this one? Um, the fear of God and the love of God. Do those two go together? And if so, how? And what does that mean for your daily life? That's what we want to explore today. And I call that combination awesome love. Awesome love. So we're going to be in one of my top 10 personal favorite passages in God's Word today. 1 John 3, 1 to 3. I'm going to read it slowly and make a few comments. Beginning in verse 1. See what great love... This word great is an amazing word. It means what awesome or amazing or otherworldly kind of love. The Father has lavished on us. The, the word lavished, don't you love just to say that? It's, it's, it sounds like what it is. Lavish, you kind of spit when you say it, like lavished. If I give you a dozen red roses, I might be saying, honey, I really love you. But if I give you 100 dozen red roses, I'm lavishing you with my love, and I'm in trouble because I spent too much money. But the Father has lavished us that we should be called children of God. Our highest title is not something like CEO or doctor or reverend or professor or author. It's child of God. That's your highest title. And then it says, and that is what we are. It's not just a name. It's your very basic identity if you've been born again. Because we've been born again, we are children of God. And this is our identity. And it says then, the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. In other words, Jesus he said, I came down from above. I was from another world and brought another worldly kind of love with me. And the world didn't recognize me. They, and most of the world didn't want that kind of love. And so since I live in you, the world is not also going to not recognize you as a child of God. They're not going to get that about you, that that's your real identity. Verse 2. Dear friends, now we are the children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. In other words, claim your identity now. Live in the security of that identity of being his child. And if you think it's wonderful now being a child of God, he's saying, just you wait. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be awesome. And then he says this, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him because we will see him as he is. The Christ that we love now by faith, we will soon get to love face to face. And when we do, our character, our attitudes, our values, our mindset is going to be transformed. We'll keep our personalities because God made those. But now we're going to have the character of Jesus Christ. That is a mind-blowing thing. And then verse 3 says this, all those who have this hope that we've just described, this hope in him, they do something. 
They fear God. They purify themselves just as he is pure. True children of God want to obey him now. They want to love him with all their heart and be pure like Jesus. That's their desire. We fail at it, but that's our desire. And if you don't have that desire, you need to question, am I really a child of God? And so this passage is a statement that, uh, that brings together his awesomeness and his love. The word awesome has almost lost its meaning in the last 20 or 30 years, don't you think? Awesome used to be reserved for seeing the Milky Way or the Grand Canyon or Mount Everest or seeing the Pacific Ocean for the first time. But now, uh, your pizza, your sneakers, your new t-shirt, your new coffee drink are awesome, man. Well, they're kind of awesome, but God is awesome in the original meaning of the word. Awesome literally means a, a causing an overwhelming feeling of reverence, admiration, or fear. He is awesome. One theologian said it this way, if we really believed that God is as powerful and as present as he really is, as, re as we say he is, we would install seat belts in the pews at church and wear crash helmets when we come to meet with him. He's being a bit facetious, but this awesome God that we come to worship, we get too familiar with him. We no longer fear his awesomeness. How big is your God? How awesome is your God? C.S. Lewis tries to capture a bit of this awesome love in the Chronicles of Narnia when Lucy is confronted by the idea of Aslan, the lion, who is a symbol of God in the story. Lucy asks, is he safe? Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Uh, who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. And Mr. Tumnus sp speaks up and says, he's wild, you know. He's wild, not a tame lion. But I want to tell you this awesome, wild God is wild about you. Every single one of you. Amen? And the big idea today is this. To get close to God, we must hold healthy fear in one hand and passionate love in the other. God is awesome and God is love. He created love. Love was his idea. It's out of his love that you exist. You came out of his love created physically. And love is his commitment and emotion toward all of you here from the biggest sinner in the room right now to the oldest saint. He is wildly in love with you. God doesn't just have love for you, though. God is love. Scripture says it several times. This is his nature. I am love. That means that everything he does is loving towards you. Even those commandments that our culture says, that's not true, that doesn't make sense. It's a commandment, it's a word of love because he can only be loving. This is our God, everything he does is an act of love, even when we can't understand it. But also because he's awesome, we must indeed fear him. To fear him is to revere him, respect him, yes, but also to have a bit of a tremble before him. Have you pulled your God down too far? Have you lost his awesomeness? Has he become the big man in the sky or your good buddy? Or is he still this awesome God that he is? In order to develop the fear of the Lord, we must recognize this God for who he is. We must glimpse his glory with our spirits, with our hearts, with our minds, his power, his might, his brilliance, his majesty, his sovereignty. This, this is the Lord God Almighty. That's why we used to sing a song I love. Uh, it's really the awesome love song to go with my message. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. What? I want to see you. I want to see you. And the chorus, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing, holy, holy, holy. This is who he is. Are you familiar with the keyhole principle. The keyhole principle is this. We are like little children peering through the keyhole of a door 
trying to see God. And we are on this side of the door, on this side of death as we live in the earth. So all we're seeing is what we can see of God through the keyhole. But we know on the other side of the door, there is much more of God than what we can see through the keyhole. Now we can see all we need to know. We can see all we can really humanly understand through the keyhole, but there's coming a day, my friend, when the door's going to be open, and we're going to walk into his presence, and we're going to see him as he is. Now, the question is, what do you do with what you can see of him now? See, we're like toddlers trying to understand the president. He's just beyond our comprehension, and yet he displays what we need to know of him. Just the glimpse of him must create awe. Although invisible to our physical senses, God is the ultimate reality, the only entity that really matters. And this is why the Bible says in Psalm 111.10 and many other places, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Of wisdom, all who follow his commands have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. If we don't allow this fear of God, this God's awesomeness to shape our thinking, our living, our decisions, our morals, then we're fools no matter how much we know. I want to tell you all true wisdom starts with four statements, I believe. Number one statement is there is a God. Number two I'm not him. You need to get that one. You're not either. I'm not him. Number three, he defines truth. And number four, I will believe fear and obey him. That's the foundation of wisdom. Let me ask you, how's your foundation? How, how wise are you? How, how many of you know rich fools, strong fools, talented fools, educated fools, superstar fools, sexy fools, powerful fools? I'm telling you, we all do. And some of us idolize those fools. How can I say that? Because Psalm 14, 1 says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and their deeds are vile. In other words, anyone in that list that doesn't believe in God and doesn't follow his ways, Scripture says they're a fool. And right now, those, they're, they're fools who uh, our culture calls wise, but the Bible says that when the Lord returns on the day of the Lord that Isaiah describes, that's all going to be over. Listen to this great verse, Isaiah 32, 5. No longer will, describing the day of the Lord, no longer will the fool be called noble, nor the scoundrel highly respected. Those days are coming to an end. Awesome love includes healthy fear of God. Someone has accurately said, if we really fear God, we have nothing else to really fear. Do you really feel God? Fear God. But also, because he is love, because he's fear, we, because he's awesome, we must fear him. But because he's love, we must adore him, knowing he adores us. The the term that God often used in the Old Testament to describe himself and the term that Jesus used to describe God and taught the term that Jesus taught us to pray in, that term, and the term that the Apostle Paul uses throughout his letters for God, that term is Father. Everybody say Father. Father. This is important. All of us have had fathers, But for many of us, the term father does not evoke memories of being loved and adored. And I'm sorry about that. It doesn't. In fact, for many of us, the term father is a bit painful. But I'm telling you, we must not dump or discard this term father because of our own personal human experience. God is not your father. He's the perfect father who loves you. And he is your father in that sense. So I've asked groups before, if you imagined uh, the perfect father, what would he be like? And they give me terms like uh, uh, wise, uh, strong, uh, understanding, compassionate, uh, loaded, like wealthy. Yeah. And God is all those things for us. God uses this term father because uh, he's not He's not making a statement about his gender in that. That's not it. But he's taken the highest thing in our physical creation and said, I am your creator physically and the one who gives you new life spiritually. 
And so because I'm the perfect father to my children, I want to use this term so you know how much I adore you. Now, when Lindsay, our biological daughter, was born, um, she had a difficult birth, and she got, her head got squeezed in the birth canal, and, uh, and she came out, and she was ugly. I'm just going to tell you. She put the ug in ugly. I, I <laughs> but you know, when I looked at her, my eyes adored her. <laughs> I, I adored her. And you know what she did to me? She turned me into a crazy man. I'm, I'm telling you. I started saying crazy words like, goo goo, ga ga. I never said that before. Making crazy faces. <laughs> Doing crazy dances. <laughs> I still do that. But that, those were to make her laugh. And the flying crazy make balloon make believe spoons of mashed potatoes into the hanger of her mouth. <laughs> she turned me into crazy man. Why? Because I adored her. I loved her. Let me ask you: if I, as such a sinful, imperfect father, had these kinds of feelings and actions towards my daughter, how does a perfect Heavenly Father, feel about you. I'm telling you, he's crazy about you. You say, well, you pastor, you don't know me. I'm telling you, he's crazy about you. He loves you with an everlasting personal love. You see, why did God create humans? I, that's a big question, but I want to give you just a, a bottom line answer. And it goes like this, because he wanted to extend the loving circle. What do I mean? In the mystery of the Trinity, there is one God in three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And within that Trinity, there is amazing, perfect love between all three of them. It's, in fact, there's a word that talks about their relationship being a perichoritic dance. Uh, they're in this loving relationship with each other. And there came a point in time where they wanted to extend that circle of love. And so they created Adam and Eve, and they created you. They wanted to extend that love. So they created humans and they gave them something. This is really important now. This is theology, but it's very important that you understand it. They gave them, uh, that God gave us free will to choose whether we would love him or not. Whether we'd receive that love or reject that love. And that's why God is currently invisible. If he was visible, everyone would be forced by his awesomeness to love him. Love can only exist when there is unforced choice. Now, I've been doing a little study about robots, and with the development of AI and ML, machine learning, and NLP, natural language processing, and RWP, real world perception, robots are becoming more and more human-like. I'm telling you, in just not very many years, everyone who can afford it can have a beautiful woman or a hunky man on their arm who has intelligent conversations with them, hugs them, has sex with them, then makes the bed, and then makes them breakfast. But can I tell you, these robots will not have the one thing that will en en enable them and allow them to love you. You will never be loved by a robot. Why? Because they won't have free will. They will have been programmed and will have learned what they are forced to do, what they must do by their programming. So God did not create robots. He created humans. He created you, and he gave you plenty of evidence of his reality, of his truth, of his love. But he did not manipulate you by, display, by displaying so much of his awesomeness 
that you were forced to love him. Only God can create a free will being, which means only God can create someone who will really love him and receive his love. This is one of the reasons why he is so very, very awesome. Can I get a witness? God is very clear about what his highest priority for you is. Every one of you in the room, this is God's highest priority for you. It is found in what Jesus called the greatest commandment, which is what? To love the Lord with your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength. This is why you were created. And the more you keep that commandment, the more you find your purpose in life, the more you find your pleasure in life, the more you find your fulfillment in life, because now you are loving this awesome God. And loving it doesn't mean just worshiping this way all the time. It means receiving his love. A love relationship is both giving and receiving, and this is what we were created for let me ask you, how well are you keeping that commandment? Um, in America, people generally hold one of five major views of God. There are the no God f- folks. These, uh, for them, God is an imaginary being, not real at all. They believe people have imagined God into existence because the people just can't face the reality that people, uh, that they're an accident, an evolution accident, uh, evolutionary accident. They can't, they can't face that. They can't face the fact that death is just the end. And so these people uh, that are religious say, okay, um, I'll have a God. But these no God people say, no, just there's no God. That's about 10% of America. Then there's the force God people. Uh, the force is with you. God is an impersonal force who keeps his distance from earth and is capricious in that sometimes the force will be with you and sometimes the force will be against you. The force God is unknowable and has little to do in terms of real interaction. That's about 10% of Americans have some form of that. And then there's the Santa God folks. About 35% of Americans have this view of God. God is a benevolent creature, or being who created humans and who is like a cuddly grandpa who lets everyone do whatever they want, no rules, and then they just take everyone to heaven when they die, except maybe those are way, way down the very naughty list. Those don't go. The Santa God. Then there's the judge God folks. For them, God is usually angry at humans and waiting to judge people unless, unless they do enough good stuff, enough religious stuff to appease his anger and you should be afraid of this judge God. Um, that's about 20% of folks. And then in America, praise the Lord, there's still about 25% of the Jesus God, folks. You know, God is defined by Jesus. Jesus, it says in Colossians, is the exact representation of the invisible God. He, he, he tells us who God is. So God is defined by Jesus in the Bible. He's an awesome, loving Father who is to be feared and revered, but also adored and loved. And although he dwells in this invisible spiritual realm, he's highly interactive with individuals who will approach him with faith. Through faith, you can have this personal love relationship with an invisible God. And those who trust in Jesus have no fear of death and judgment. I want to make sure you've got the right God today. The awesome love God. Now, a couple other points I need to make before I'm done is this, that mature love will exclude fear of punishment because there's a passage of Scripture that gets confusing when you bring together fear and love, and that's in 1 John 4, 17 to 18. I'll read it for you. This is how love is made complete or mature among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we're like Jesus. There is no fear in love. There it is, Larry. You're not teaching us well. There's no fear in love. It says right there. But perfect love drives out fear. See? Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Now, you have to read this carefully. The kind of fear that love drives out is not a reverence of God in his awesomeness. No. 
It drives out a fear about the future, a fear about death, a fear about eternity, a fear of being condemned or punished by God. The more you're in love with this awesome God, the less fear and the more confidence you have about facing death and living life. God's awesome love also, another point, is that God's awesome love includes discipline. Now, this is a point you might not enjoy very much, (laughs) but it's a good point. God's awesome love includes discipline, and we should both fear and desire God's discipline. I remember a time when Lindsay was maybe three, almost four, and she ran out in the street. I told her, don't run out in the street, and, and she ran out into the street, and I disciplined her. I made her sit in the corner for 30 minutes. She she was crying and shouting. She was saying, you don't love me. You don't love me. You're so mean. You're so mean. You don't love me. And I said, Lindsay, Papa loves you, and that's why you're sitting there. Because Papa does not want you to do what will hurt you and could kill you. Papa doesn't want a semi-truck hitting you. She said, what's a semi-truck? This, keep that picture in mind and hear this scripture. Some selected passages from Hebrews 12, 6 through 11. Because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. God disciplines us for our good. In order that we might share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. God loves you enough to discipline you, and it's not pleasant. It is painful. Is that the God you serve? Is that the kind of God you want to be loved by, or would you rather just run out into the street whenever you want? This God loves you enough to train you into the abundant life, the holy life, the life that's filled with his love. When you're going through a hardship, do you accuse the Lord? Lord, you don't love me. You've forgotten me. Or do you say, Lord, what are you trying to teach me? What what are you trying to train me in, Lord? What are you teaching me to say no of or to let go of or to say yes to? How are you training me through this? You see, the fear of the Father's discipline will keep us from all kinds of bad decisions that will hurt us and others. And so he said, welcome my discipline because it's a sign of my love and a sign that you're my child. So to get close to God, we must hold a healthy fear of God in one hand and a passionate love for God in the other. If we do not hold the fear of God in the one hand, We will bring God down to our level, or we will not reverence God as he really is worthy of. We'll bring him down. But if we do not receive his love and give him our love, we will never ascend to the places that he wants for us. We'll miss his great love and fail to obey his greatest commandment. I want to close in a very different way. I want to close by showing you um, a historic photo that's very, very famous and speaks to, in my mind, illustrates awesome love. It's a historic picture of the Oval Office, President Kennedy sitting at the desk resolute in the uh, Oval Office. And at three years of age, his son, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., is underneath that desk at the feet of his father. JFK Jr. had no idea of how powerful his father was, but he was that. He was his dad, and he was the one behind the desk. The picture of this photo is where we were created uh, to live. This photo was at the feet of our powerful father. At his feet, understanding how powerful he is. But at any moment, 
jumping into his lap, knowing that he will hug us and kiss us because he's crazy about us. This is the awesome love that you and I were created to live in. And so this is my prayer for us, is that we would be light and life, that kind of church, and those kind of Christians who live in the awesome love of an amazing God, that we'd fear God and receive his love every day until we see him face to face. Would you stand with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We pray, oh God, that this day our fear of you would increase, Lord, that you would grow larger in our mind and our hearts. And Lord, we pray today we would experience in new and personal ways, deeper than we ever have before, how greatly loved we are by you. And Lord, may we just respond with our love for you. And would this, oh God, make us more and more like Jesus. With every head bowed and every eye closed, If you're here today and you haven't become a child of God, you're not sure that you're born again. You you don't have a desire to become like Jesus living in your heart. But you want today to make that decision. With nobody looking around, would you just raise your hand? I, I just want to acknowledge that desire that you want to become a child of God if you're not sure that you are. Anyone? Let me ask you this. If you're here today and you know that uh, you're a child of God, but you haven't been living close to God, you've been distant from him, maybe even treating him like Santa God or like Judge God, but at a distance, and you'd like to recommit yourself to him, would you raise your hand with mine? Because I want to do that. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I want to know you more in your awesomeness and in your love. Lord, in fact, let me ask another question. For any of you that just want to get closer to God through healthy fear and passionate love, would you raise your hand with mine? Lord Jesus, we are here because of your great love. You've created us, you've saved us, and you've called us to yourself. And now, Lord Jesus, we want to live the lives that revere you. So, God, would you show us those places? Lord, we welcome your discipline, even though it's not pleasant, Lord. We want to be trained into righteousness and joy and peace and love. So, Lord, today, individually and as a church, may we leave this place filled with more of the awesome love of an amazing God. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Can we just thank the Lord for his goodness? Amen. Amen. You are greatly loved by the Father, and would you receive God's blessing as you get ready to go? Fellowship on the patio. Extend your love to each other. And now in the name of the Father who created you because he wanted there to be one of you forever. And in the name of his son, Jesus, who came as the gift of the Father and then laid down his life because he loved you so much and wanted to be with you forever. And in the name of the Holy Spirit that wants to fill you today with healthy fear and passionate love so that you might go on the mission God has created you for. May you go this week and this life enjoying the awesome love of a living God. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. God bless the church.